Well, good morning everyone and welcome to another fly fishing podcast. I am um, out in Derbyshire today on the Derbyshire Derwent and as per usual with my podcasts, the conditions are all, conditions are all against me. I'm in a what's effectively a river in flood. Very big water. Um, slightly coloured but it's actually a nice day to be out and um, we've got a horrific forecast for the next couple of weeks of freezing temperatures so I decided to come out today um, and watch this will probably be my last grayling session of the year so I think even one fish today will be a result um, it's a beautiful piece of river um, wooded on both sides uh, there's a few snowdrops appearing on the bank and the, the trees are there but they're bare um, but the birds are singing, there's a patch of blue sky. So I'm going to get myself in and uh, have a go at check nymphing uh, up this patch of river. I've got a 10 foot 5 weight rod today, nice soft action. Gives me a little bit of reach and ability to, to hook into these fish at close range without bouncing them off. Um, about 8 feet of leader. And then I've got two flies today. I've got a, a peeping caddis uh, on the point. And I've got a dropper about 10, 10 inches above there with a little uh, check tan bug on, which is one of my favourite flies. So I'm going to prospect up the stream, short casts, check nymphim, and um, we'll see if there's a grayling there. But I'm just going to have to be slightly careful today as I head into the water because there is some ooh, real, real water coming through. Uh, where I'm stood at the minute is normally just a, maybe around my ankles and it's already over my knees, so prospecting up and see how we go so first cast got my wading stick in my hand i'm going to keep hold of that and nice and easy just work my way upstream i've greased up the end of the line as i normally would as a uh, so it floats nice and high on the water and this will work as my strike indicator so i'm watching the end of the line as i trundle the flies down and if it stops or jabs away i'll be striking could actually do with a uh, and my other setup. I've got a high vis mono loop on the end, which is easy to see, but I've not got that on this this setup. And I've actually got a white line in the. Uh, oh, well that was a take then. I've got a white line in the. Uh, there's a lot of glare on the water, and it's um it means it's actually quite hard to see this today. I didn't think of that. This peeping caddis is a a new pattern for the shot this for this season. So, as well as recording the podcast, I'm going to put this down as product testing. Let's move up a bit. I think I'll uh, try and concentrate a little bit on these bits of river out of the current as well just the slightly more sheltered bits for my benefit as well as the fishes oh it's hard to see this leader we're today uh, about a month until the, the trout season begins I'm getting bumps and stuff on the getting bumps and knocks here, but it's uh, it's rocks. I'm just snagged up on a rock at the minute. That's a good sign, really. It shows me that I'm getting down nice to the bottom. It's just you can actually get across to your leader and pull your leader, and you tend to find it comes off. There we go. Let's check this opportunity just to check the flies. They all look fine. Is 
it's, it's nice to have this when you check nymphing in a river like this with a lot of water just a, a 10 foot rod or even 11 foot nice and soft and soft action so when you do hook these fish at close range you get a nice bend in the rod straight away and you don't bump them off you certainly don't want to be fishing with one of these uh, stiff fast, fast action rods in situations like this because you'll find you lose a lot of fish There's some real power in this water. You, I know this piece of river very well, but if we sail on there, just got to take my time and in these conditions, these grayling are going to be fast on the bottom. They will be sheltering behind or in front of rocks or in any little holes or depressions in the stream bed and got to get these flies right down on their noses. The water temperature is reasonably cold as well so they're not going to be feeding too enthusiastically. I know that grayling will feed on cold days and even so Not ideal at all. Yeah. It is a lovely fly, this um, peeping caddis. It imitates the caddis larva as it um, crawls out of its case. So you've got the, the case caddis and then a little bit of the larva at the end. And the grayling, especially, are very, very fond of caddis fly. And they will happily eat them in their cases or coming out the cases. They've even been seen in... i just get through this bit of current. They've even been seen to um, root around a little bit grayling with their noses and you know, moving stones around looking for caddis. So they're very familiar. I've got my summer waders on as well. My neoprene uh, fleece line waders are leaking as usual, so I put the summer waders on and by golly, it's cold. Water's fast as well, as you can probably hear. It's a totally different atmosphere down on the river in winter time. The trees are bare and the water's strong and powerful and when you come out in summer and everything's green and there's a lush canopy over your head and there's that kind of buzz of electricity and heat in the air and the flies are around and the fish are rising. But I'm uh, I'm fond of both. I, uh, I enjoy being out in these conditions. It's a challenge and it looks like you, the river's barren and looks like there's not a fish to be caught and you can you don't expect that connection on the end of the line and when it does come it's really really is rewarding. Oh that shot away but I suspect that's a rock and there's a few rocks down in this little patch here. And shot away again. Oh, this current's powerful on my feet. If I lift the leg up to move upstream, it's knocking it, knocking it down. I've had a good season this year on the grayling. Some really, really good days with grayling. Sometimes you, they seem to be loads and sometimes not many. And they do move around, they are fairly nomadic, so you're going to get years where you get a few shoals moving up into your piece of river or 
a bit of river you fish and then you're going to get a, a few years where they move elsewhere. do not want to fall in today. But yeah, I've had a good year on the grayling. My um, predator fly fishing season for pike and perch, I will happily admit this year has been a disaster. I've um, had a few, few perch, a few small jacks. And I've, I've put a lot of time into it this year and it's just, just not happened for me. Um, combination probably of just bad luck. Uh, and one of the main waters that I fish has been drained, well half of it was drained and I think what happened was as they drained it all the, all the weed died off as it was exposed. So when they put a bit more water back in, there was no weed. And traditionally in that venue, all the, the pike have always been around the weed and the perch, ready to ambush. And I suspect they've just moved away. So there's been nothing there. But yeah, it's been a total disaster. But once they've, uh, once they've finished spawning, and they get into post-spawning and they've had a rest, I'll be back on them and see if we can get into a few pike. And um, hopefully this year I've got some uh, bigger plans with the saltwater fly fishing, which if you listen to the podcasts regularly, you'll know that I'm very, very into. I'm going to try and get around the east coast of the UK this year for experiment with the saltwater fly over there, because it's... Ooh, I think that was just a rock. Yeah, nothing so far that I would say was a take. And the, the, the leaders, the line stopped a few times, but I think it's just been rocks, if I'm honest. But with this method, you strike at everything. Always presume it's a fish. And a short line, only two or three feet. Tap it upstream with your heavy flies on and let that line trundle down the river. Just moving the rod tip down with it and just keeping the last six to eight inches of line on the water. And that's the bit you need to be watching. If that dips away, then you strike. These droppers. Yeah, there's a bit of weed on the peeping caddis. I think we'll just take that off. Yeah, so what we've got four weeks left of the trout season. Everyone will be out there full of enthusiasm, wanting to fish, and it's hard work starting towards the end of March. You know, there's a, often people say to me, uh, I'll get calls, you know, two weeks into the season. I'm not catching anything. What am I doing wrong? Probably do nothing wrong. It's just the fish aren't, aren't interested. And it's cold and there's only just finished spawning and the rivers are pushing through at pace and there's melted snow coming down. There's no leaves on the trees. Uh, old chap I used to know would say, yeah, no point in fishing the river until there's leaves on the trees and I never took his advice. I was straight out there on the first day of the season, obviously, but there is an element of truth in there. It's hard work sometimes in these rain-fed rivers. You can feel those flies bumping down the bottom, so that's good. Let's keep tapping it up. When the river gets like this, when it's in flood, it loses its features. It's normally it's this part of river, there's little current streams and diversions behind rocks and little slacks and back eddies. Whereas now it's just one huge piece of water of equal pace and just having to try and remember where where these little features are under the water. 
where the rocks and little scour holes are. I imagine that's where the grayling are going to be. There's a bit of, bit of blue sky just poking through the trees. Some lovely old trees on this piece of river. Old gnarly trees with, with bent and twisted branches. and You can see where the trees have grown through old walls. and Those walls must be 100 or so years old, covered in moss. We've got the woods on the far side there. and Often while I'm stood here fishing out, have a deer, come down for a drink and you stay nice and still. A lot of the time if you stood in the river they don't notice you. And then we get normally get two or three kingfishers a day coming past. And the dippers are always here. In fact I can see a dipper further upstream just sat on a rock. Right, we're just getting towards a bit now which is normally quite good for grayling so it's just whether this extra flow has put them has moved them on right, let's keep heading up I'm just about on this nice patch now so the next 20 feet or so there's a little channel that's scoured, a little hole and then a channel behind it and there's always a fish in there normally it's just with a get my fly in front of the thing yeah, like I said at the beginning there looking at the conditions and the state of the river and the time of year I think one fish would be a, a result today. But this is this is the reality of, um, of fly fishing. I think a lot of the time when you look at videos and uh, see the pictures online of people catching all these fish, it makes you think that uh, that you should be catching fish constantly, but. The reality is there's lots of days like this. If you're fishing for wild fish on, on rivers like this, there is just it's it's tough. It's challenging and you know you will have days when you're blank, days when it doesn't go right, days when you cast into trees. We all do it. It's just I think that's what makes it so rewarding when you do when you do catch. Actually a bit of sunshine coming out there. Huh? There's plenty of snow drops out on the bank and there's a the odd uh, little sprouting of wild garlic as well I can see. Well, apparently if you believe the newspapers we've got two weeks of freezing cold temperatures on the way which if we get it and we get some snow as well is really going to probably knock things on the head a little bit for the beginning of the trout season I get through normally one pair of waders one pair of summer waders and one pair of winter waders a year believe it or not we've been out instructing and stuff I've, last year I'm not going to name and shame the brand but I had to send a pair of waders about three times they lasted well, a couple of trips each time before they started leaking and I'm yet to find a brand of waders that will not leak in fact the best waders I've ever had were a pair of nylon waders with the fitted boot and they I think they cost 22 quid and all this time they've lasted me I've probably had them 10 years 
and then just keep when my expensive waders lean, keep reverting back to them. Oops. Right, well, I'm really fighting against this current now. It's pretty horrific, actually. Throwing these Czech nymphs up. Well, I've nearly reached the top of this patch where this little channel is. Just finish this last bit. This is in the season. This is always reliable for a fish. Is your uh, this is your banker uh, banker spot where you can almost guarantee catching one. But what I might try and do is go and fish a bit of the slightly slacker water further downstream. Maybe there's a grayling that's just sheltering out of this uh, powerful current. I'll try and drop the nymph in down there. So hopefully the next podcast will be uh, back on the trout. Yes, and then what we've got planned for this year, we've got two or three saltwater trips, concentrating on the east coast, like I mentioned. So trying some waters that aren't particularly known for the saltwater fly. And I'm off up to the Tay salmon fishing at the end of May. So we might try and do one from up there. And then a few more little trout trips booked in here and there, hopefully. I'd like to try fishing some rivers that I've never fly fished before. Saying the birds are busy making the nest, they're flying across the river from tree to tree, picking bits of bark and they seem happy enough. My legs are absolutely frozen. And you can see on the banks where the vegetation has been swept over by the river. It's been uh, pretty high this year. Plenty of rain. Of course on this river what we also have is at the top of the river there's the Lady Bar Reservoir and when that's kicking the water out it does bring the levels up. So what have I got on flies? I've, I mentioned the peeping caddis which is imitating the actual caddis grub when it crawls out of the its shell. Uh, and the other one I've got is my all-time all favourite, which is the Czech tan bug, which as I think I always believe, really, if you get that in front of a grayling, it's going to take it. They are very, very, very successful flies. And that really imitates um, either the caddis or the shrimp. It does a good imitation of both, but... Any regular listeners here will have heard me going on and on about that fly. I just find we all have our flies that we trust and that one for me over the years has caught me an awful lot of grayling and trout. Um, yeah, especially with grayling. And I'm going to try it this year on some coarse fish on the river. I really fancy having a crack at some barbel and Go on, Grayling. Yes, what was I saying? We all have our favourite flies, which we trust. It's interesting, I was reading a, a little thing on, online the other night about people's favourite flies and people's least favourite flies or flies that they never caught on. And, you know, it's, it's incredible. Uh, there's people saying I can never catch on pheasant tail nymphs. And 
I was thinking that's probably one of the one of the one of the nymphs that catches me the most fish. Other people just don't have confidence in it, so they don't use it. Other people are saying I can never catch on a Griffiths gnat. You know? Thinking well, as, as dry as go, Griffiths gnats and are probably one of them, my most productive. So everyone's different, and I think once you have confidence in your selection, you tend to stick with it if it if it works and stick with it. That's a bit of tiny bit of warmth on my face there, just streaming through the breaks in the tree, the gaps in the trees. Come on, Mr. Grayling or Mrs. Grayling, where are you? The image is hatching now. Just that warmth has been enough, that that warmth and that light's enough to just start the hatch. And this, this fast water, I don't think fish will be bothered about those tiny midges. What I want them to be bothered about is my peeping caddy saw Jack Tan bug. But at the minute, they're not interested in that either. As ever, it's lovely to be out. I've been in the office solid for three weeks. I moved the um, fly shop over to a new e-commerce platform and to be honest, I've been working 14 or 15 hours a day pretty solidly, just getting everything shifted over and getting all the products back up and right. And I've just been dying for a bit of fresh air, so it's just lovely to be out on the river. Keep plugging away. Lots of exciting new flies going on the shop this year. Lots of new patterns and Bugs, dries, emerges. Well, that's me done. I, I can't feel me toes, I can't feel my fingers. My legs are like two blocks of ice and I've not seen a grayling, but it's been lovely to be out. So thank you. Thanks once again for listening. Really appreciate all the uh, feedback and the, the emails and messages from the podcast. And don't forget, if you want to find out more about our coaching, visit us at www.peaksflyfishing.com or for the fly shop, it's shop.peaksflyfishing.com. Until next time, thank you. Bye-bye.